Well, good morning and welcome. Thank you for tuning in this morning. We hope that you had a very Merry Christmas. If you are a guest that is joining us this morning, we wanted to say thank you so much for joining us this morning. We're glad that you did, and we would love to connect with you. Uh, Feel free to message us right here on Facebook to shoot us an email, firstbaptistcarmi at gmail.com. Get in touch with one of our staff members, and we would love to connect with you. But as we begin our service this morning, we wanted to prepare our hearts for worship by looking to God's word. So let's read from God's word, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. This is the word of the Lord, and we are so excited to worship with you this morning, to spend some time over this next hour fixing our mind's attention and our heart's affection on Jesus. We believe that God is worthy of every praise that we could ever give him. So we're going to do just that this morning. We're going to praise him. So let's worship. Whisper and talk. 
Before we enter into this next song, I just wanted to read a word from Job. Um, I just think it's so fitting with these songs as we worship him this morning. And it says, God stretches the northern sky over empty space and hangs the earth on nothing. He wraps the rain in his thick clouds, and the clouds don't burst with the weight. He covers the face of the moon, shrouding it with his clouds. He created the horizon when he separated the waters. He set the boundary between day and night. The foundations of heaven tremble. They shudder at his rebuke. By his power, the sea grew calm. By his skill, he crushed the great sea monster. His spirit made the heavens beautiful, and his power pierced the gliding serpent. These are just the beginning of all that he does, merely a whisper of his power. Who then can comprehend the thunder of his power? And that is the God who we have come this morning to worship. Um, he is all-powerful, almighty. And God, we just praise you for that. As we sing this next song, I just, this is my prayer that we would be transformed by the renewing of our minds.
just thank you for who you are, and I pray uh, just as Andy leads the word this morning that you will just help us to hear your word, Lord, and to learn from your word, God, that we may be more like you and know you on a deeper level. Pray all this in your name. Amen. All right. Well, good morning again, and thank you for tuning in again. If maybe this is your first time tuning in with us at First Baptist Church, or if you don't know me, my name is Andy, and I'm the youth pastor here at the church, and it is such an honor and a privilege to be able to share with you from God's Word this morning. So if you have your Bibles, and I hope that you do, or I hope the beauty of us being here on, on stream is that you could go and grab them very quickly. So I hope that you would. Would you turn to the book of Mark chapter 2? Mark chapter 2, we're going to be at the very beginning there. If maybe you're new to the Bible, you can look at the table of contents, or you can find the New Testament, flip all the way through Matthew and find the book of Mark. We're going to be Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. But as you're turning there this morning, I want to invite you to reflect back. Some of you reflect back. The year was 1974. Some would remember it. Uh, some would just have heard about this particular event that we're about to talk about, maybe seen it on Sports Center or the History Channel or something like that. But some people refer to this as the greatest sporting event in the 20th century the Rumble in the Jungle. The Rumble in the Jungle, very famous boxing match. It pitted George Foreman, who was an undefeated heavyweight champion, against a guy named Muhammad Ali, who many of us have heard about, who was also a former heavyweight champion. And this story, this uh, fight is famous for many reasons, but one that I want to talk about in particular this morning. You see, Muhammad Ali came into this fight with a really interesting plan. You see, they were two different fighters. George Foreman was a very powerful. He packed a lot of power behind his punches, while Muhammad Ali was more, he was fast. He was quick. He relied on his technical skill. So Ali's plan coming into this match was to kind of get George Foreman riled up early, to get George Foreman worked up early and coming after him, throwing punch after punch. And that's what happened. George Foreman threw punch after punch at Ali. But that wasn't the end of the plan. It wasn't, the plan wasn't just to sit there and get punched for the entire fight. The hope and the plan was that George Foreman would throw all these punches early in the fight and kind of get tired, get, uh, wear himself out. And that's exactly what happened. The eighth round came and Foreman was a little tired, was a little fatigued. And at that moment, Muhammad Ali, who had been on the ropes the entire fight, he came off the ropes and he knocked George Foreman out in the eighth round. Even though he was on the ropes for the entire fight, Muhammad Ali won this fight on the ropes. That's an interesting term that we've heard time to time before. It's a pretty famous boxing term. And really what it means in boxing is that a boxer has got hit, he's got punch, punch after punch, hit after hit, and he is leaned back on the ropes for support. In other words, he can't take too many more punches. And maybe you hear that in 2020 of all years and you think, you know what? Uh, that's me. That's me. I have taken punch after punch this year. We have gone through trial after trial this year, and I don't feel like I can take too many more punches. We're going to talk this morning about why there is hope. And to do that, we're going to look to God's word to a man who was literally on the ropes. And of course, Mark chapter 2, we're going to talk about a man who was lowered by four ropes down to Jesus. And we're going to look at how his life was radically changed as a result. So if you want to follow along, Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. And when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home and many were gathered together. So there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts. Why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. 
Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things in your heart? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed, and walk? But that you, know, that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we have never seen anything like that. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. God, we are thankful for this time together. We're thankful for the worship that we were just led in by an awesome worship team. God, I pray that as we, uh, as we look to your word this morning, that you would limit distractions in our homes, that you would limit distractions uh, as, we, uh, as we worship together this virtual way. But God, I pray that you would uh, speak to us from your word this morning, and we pray this in your name. Amen. All right. Uh, so we're going to look at four headings this morning. What we're going to do is we're going to look verse by verse through this scripture, and we're going to do it by looking at four headings. So kind of so you know where we're going, here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at first the unanticipated crowd size, the unanticipated size of the crowd. So that's first. And then we're going to move on and we're going to look at four or five men and an unlikely mission. So the unlikely mission will be the second thing we look at. And then we'll look at Jesus's unexpected response. The unexpected response Jesus gave. And finally, we're going to talk about an undeniable miracle. But first this morning, we're going to talk about the unanticipated crowd size. Mark chapter 2, verses 1 and 2 says, And when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home, and many were gathered together. So there was no more room, not even at the door, and he was preaching the word to them. So the, the place is packed. And it's not packed to our knowledge because they had the biggest or the most fancy house in town. It's not packed to our knowledge because they were serving the best food in town. It was packed because there were a bunch of people there who were excited to see Jesus move, who were anticipating what Jesus was about to do in that moment. Now, did everybody in believe in Jesus as the Messiah? Uh, possibly not. And I would even go as far to say uh, probably not. It reminds me of one of my cousins when he was in high school. Each time he would come to our house in Tennessee or we would come up to his house in Illinois or have a family reunion, he would tell my brother and myself the same thing each year. He would say, Andy, Zach, I can finally do it this year. I can finally slam dunk a basketball. I can finally do it. And year after year, we didn't believe him. We never believed him. But though we never believed him, we noticed that he was getting taller we noticed that he was getting stronger. We noticed that he was getting faster. We noticed that he was getting better at basketball. So what did we do each year? We'd go out to the basketball court and see. We'd go out to the court to see if he was able to slam dunk. But something similar was probably true of this crowd. Some of this crowd had probably heard stories about Jesus, about the things that he was doing. And so they wanted to be there to see what he did in that moment. So there would have been people like that, these kinds of people. And then there would have been people there who were disciples of Jesus, but they were there excited to see Jesus teach. They were there excited to see what Jesus was going to do. And as I've been studying this scripture for the last couple of weeks, a question keeps popping into my head time after time. What kind of a mindset do we approach, do we approach our worship gatherings with? What kind of a mindset do we approach our special events that we do with? And the reason that I thought that, and the reason that I asked that is because I think if we're not careful, we can kind of fall into a trap, a trap of saying that, that we come to worship together because we've done it since we were this tall, or a trap of saying we come to worship together because uh, that's at the top of our to-do list and we want to we wanna cross it off so that we can move on to other things. And the Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, he's talking about the message of the gospel, the gospel message, and what he says is to consider it as first importance, to consider the message of the gospel as first importance. And sometimes we read that and think, okay, well, it goes to the top of our to-do list, and then we cross it off and we move on to other things. 
That's not what he means there. What he means when he says to consider this message of first importance, he means to put it at the center of your life and make it to where everything else revolves around this message. So when we come to church, do we come to church excited to see God move? Do we come to church expecting God to save someone? Do we come to church hoping and praying that someone would would repent, would confess to God their sin and would repent of their sin? Do we come to church hoping that, that this baptism will behind me, that it's full of water and that we would get to baptize someone? Do we come to church anticipating what God is going to do? It reminds me of in the Old Testament. Moses had just passed away and Joshua had taken over as the ruler of Israel. And they were about to go and take over the promised land, to conquer the promised land. And these were an expectant people. These people were eager to see what God was going to do. Joshua even says in Josh, Joshua 3, 5, he says, consecrate yourself for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. He tells the people, the Lord will do wonders among you tomorrow. And my prayer for our church family is that that would be our expectation when we gather to worship, is that that would be our expectation when we send our youth to summer camp, is that that would be our expectation about vacation Bible school or our outreach events, that tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among us, having a confidence that God is going to work through us and he is going to work among us. So this leads into our second heading, and we're going to spend a majority of our time in this heading this morning, an unlikely mission, the unlikely mission of these people, verses three and four. And they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let the bed down on which the paralytic lay. A few weeks ago, I had an opportunity to speak at a a chapel service at New Hope Christian Academy here at their Carmi campus. And as I was walking in, we had a great chapel service, by the way, but as I was walking in, I was talking with the principal, and he asked a question that kind of took me aback for a second. He said, Andy, are you good at speaking through distractions? And like I said, it kind of took me aback for a second, and I was like, well, I am a youth pastor. We do work with middle schoolers, so uh, we're, I, I've had to deal with distractions a couple of times. And he said, well, good, because in the room you're speaking, uh, behind you, they're going to be setting up for next week's book fair. And it was a great chapel service. We had a great time together. Those kids were excited, uh, but they were really, really excited about what was going on behind me, seeing their favorite books and their favorite posters and their favorite accessories being wheeled in. But the reason I say this is, can you imagine the distraction this had to have been as Jesus was teaching? That these men uh, making a hole in the roof? Can you imagine? You're there, Jesus is teaching, you're listening to Jesus teach, and all of a sudden you hear a racket, a ruckus up above you, and you you look up, and and, uh, there's some clanging going on up there, and you see uh, tiles and sticks and and, and dust begin to fall, and all of a sudden there's a, a hole in the ceiling. And I'm going to tell you something, that is every youth pastor's worst nightmare, a hole in the wall, a hole in the ceiling or something like that. But there's a hole in the ceiling. Light shines through, uh, four faces look down from above. And all of a sudden, this man's bed, his mat starts to descend in through this hole. And what we know by reading this scripture is that, is that this room was packed that this place was packed, that, uh, that there was no room. So they would have had to spread. They would have had to go somewhere for this man's mat to have had reach the ground. But what we see in this scripture is that these four friends had the faithfulness, had, had the faith in Jesus, and had the compassion on their friend to say that we're going to get our friend to Jesus no matter the obstacles, no matter what it takes. And if this tells us anything, it's that the way we live our lives can have an impact on other people. The way we live our lives can have an impact on other people. One of the things we tell our youth often, and it's a goal for individual youth, and it's also a goal for our youth group collectively, is that we would know God and that we would live our lives to make him known. That we would know God and we would live our lives to make to make him known. And if the second part of this statement is true, if the second part of this statement shows anything to be true, it's that the way we live our lives can have an impact on other people. So what we're going to do over these next couple of minutes is we're going to look at three ways the way we live our lives can impact the people 
around us. Now, there's definitely more ways that we can impact the people around us, but with God's help, these are the three ways that we can impact the people around us that we're gonna talk about this morning. First, we can impact the people around us through the friend that we are. We can impact the people around us through the friend that we are. So the amazing thing about this scripture, as we just talked about, is that this man, this paralyzed man, had four friends who were going to get him to Jesus no matter what it take or what it took. Think about their journey for a second. They would have had to travel uh, from somewhere to get to this house. We don't know how far away they came from or how long away they traveled for, but really any distance is a long distance to carry a, a grown man with you. And so we can assume that they tried the door first. We can assume that they went in or tried to go in through the door first. Most people don't go in through the roof as their first option, but they weren't able to make it that way. And at this point in the story is when most people probably would have said, well, we gave it a good shot. We'll maybe wait out here to see if we can catch him uh, if he leaves. Or maybe even more, we gave it the old college try. Uh, we're going to go home now. But these friends didn't. These friends uh, were not going to take no for an answer. They were going to get their friend to Jesus no matter the obstacle. Do we have friends like that in our lives? Do we have friends in our lives who care about our spiritual walk with the Lord? Do we have friends in our life who are willing to hold us accountable? Because make no mistake about it, the friends that we have in this life will either point us to Jesus or will pull us away from him. The friends that we have in this life will either point us to God or will tear us away from him. Proverbs chapter 13 verse 20 says, whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. Or as a friend of mine who's the pastor in Memphis says, he says, if you play in the dirt, you're gonna get dirty. If you play in the dirt, you're gonna get dirty. And we often use this as a lesson to our kids and to our students is that the people we surround ourselves with matter. Now, and it's not so that we can take the fun out of anything. It's because we believe that there is a real enemy who is really on the prowl, who is really looking to devour someone. And we believe that we are much stronger together united. But this is also an important lesson for us as adults to learn as well, that the people we surround ourselves with, that the people we surround our families with are important. Jordan Easley, who's a pastor and an author, he said it this way in his book called Life Change. He said, a friend can be the difference between success and failure. They can be the difference between reaching our destination or detouring to some uncharted destination in life. Friends are meant to travel the road with us, not to carry the map or to drive the car. When we're headed in a particular direction and start taking every detour our friends want to take, we'll either dramatically delay or never arrive at our desired destination. Friends have a tremendous capacity to influence the direction of our life. When it comes to the friends we have in life, they will either carry us to Jesus, like the paralytic's friends, or carry us away. Our youth have been studying through the book of Acts for the last few months. And one of my favorite parts of our study was when we were talking about Acts chapter 2. We see one of the very uh, earliest churches in Acts 2. We see is that this church devotes themselves to a few things. They devote themselves to the apostles' teaching. They devote themselves to prayer. They devote themselves to the breaking of bread. But one thing that we really talked about with our youth is how they devoted themselves to fellowship. They devoted themselves to fellowship. And in the original text, this word fellowship means it's talking about a community of believers that love and that care for one another so deeply, who are on the same mission as each other, who support each other, who love one another, sometimes love each other so much that they have to have uncomfortable or awkward conversations with one another. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter four calls this speaking the truth to one another in love. This is what we as Christians are called to do. The people we surround ourselves with matter. Now, I wanted to drop this in here. This doesn't mean that we are called to be a people of seclusion or a people of isolation. It is vitally important that we befriend and build relationships with people who are not believers. And while doing so, it is so important that we model both with our words and with our actions what it looks like to live a life with the gospel at the center. So secondly, we can make an impact on the people around us through the family that we disciple. We can impact the people around us through the family we disciple. It is both a command and a calling on the life of every Bible-believing family to disciple your kids, 
to teach them who Jesus is and to lead them as they grow in God's word. That's what Moses says to the Israelites in the passage that we read at the beginning of service, and I'll read it again. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9, he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and, the, and, a, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts on your house and on your gates. I had a football coach in high school who had a saying before every game. As we would be warming up, as we'd be getting ready to play, he would walk around the field and he would say, uh, early and often, early and often. And what he meant by this is he wanted us to come out early from the very first snap of the game, playing hard, flying around the field, giving our best effort, hustling, hitting hard. And he wanted us to do that often. He wanted us to, in this way, set the tempo for the game and kind of let the other team know what they were up against. And the same could be true for discipling our kids and discipling our families early and often. We are called to, to teach them who Jesus is, to start pointing them to Jesus at an early age and to do it often. That's what Moses is saying here. That's what Moses is saying here when he says, when you're at your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise, everywhere and all the time, we are to point our kids and our families to Jesus. For Christian families, this is not optional. And one of the ways that, that we do this is by teaching our kids priorities is by teaching our kids that, that, that our relationship with God, that our walk with God is more important than anything else this world has to offer. Our walk with God is more important than high school sports. It's more important than middle school sports. It's more important than uh, travel sports. Our walk with God is more important than an extra couple hours of sleep on Sunday morning or a late night out on Saturday night. Our relationship with God is more important than our population. Because what we know to be true is that we, when we live a life with God's word at the center of it, there are going to be people that don't get it. There are going to be people that maybe even make fun of you. There are going to be places that you're not invited to. But what we tell our students is that this life is worth it. That living a life knowing God and living to make him known is worth it. And I got to tell you this morning that I'm so inspired by the faith of so many students. I hear stories both of people here at church and of people in the community about our students. I've heard a story of one of our students who would pray with his friends and even people that he didn't know in the lunchroom. I've heard a story of a couple of our youth starting a Bible study for their friends after school. I've heard stories of our youth telling their friends about Jesus. I've heard stories of our friends inviting or of our, our youth inviting people to church. Parents, you have made an impact on your kids' lives. And if maybe you're the parent who says, uh, you know what, I've dropped the ball. I've dropped the ball in this realm. It's not too late. It's not too late. To, to, you can still have an impact on the lives of your kids. Maybe you say, I don't know how to do it. I don't know where to start. I would encourage you to, to first off, uh, to, to just get di do, dive into God's word, but also reach out to Pastor Drake. Reach out to our children's minister, Vanessa Kaiser. Reach out to one of our deacons. You're more than welcome to reach out to me. I don't know anything about parenting, but I would be happy to point you to resources and to authors and to things like that. Maybe for you and your family, you need to start by making spiritual goals for your family as we look towards 2021. Start by making spiritual goals. Maybe you and your family want to make evangelism more of a priority this year. Maybe when you're comfortable going back to restaurants, you want to say, hey, we're going to ask this waiter or this waitress how we can pray for them. And then when they tell us how we can, we're really going to pray for them. And we're really going to learn their name and we're really going to care about them. Maybe for you and your family, you want to have a devotional time each night where you can just fix your family's attention on God. Or maybe for you, you want to start a time each week with your family where uh, you have praise reports, where you ask your family, how have you seen God move this week? And finally, and very quickly, we can impact the people around us through the faithfulness that we show. So through the friends, the friend that we are, through the family we disciple, and then through the faithfulness that we show. There's a famous author named C.S. Lewis, and he once said it this way. He said, don't shine so others can see you. Shine so that through you, Others can see him. 
I love that quote. But up to this point, we've kind of looked at the people we can impact under our direct impact, our family and our friends. But we can also have an impact on the people that we may or might, may not know that live their life around us. Think about in this story, in Mark chapter 2, if you were a random bystander in the story, you would have been amazed and full of awe at what Jesus, about what we're about to see Jesus do. But you also probably would have been inspired by the faith of these friends, by these friends saying, we're not going to take no for an answer. The way that we live our lives, the way that we love other people can work to point people towards Jesus. John 13, 35 says that. It says, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So thirdly, this morning, we're going to look at the unexpected response of Jesus Verse five says, and when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. Now let's go back and let's put ourselves in these characters' shoes again. They have gotten their friend all the way there. They've tried to go through the door. They couldn't. They've gone in through the roof and they finally got their friend to Jesus. And how does he respond? By saying, son, your sins are forgiven. There was probably a part of them that was like, are are you kidding me? We get our friend who's paralyzed all the way here to Jesus and that is how he responds. But really what confused the crowd wasn't out of character for Jesus at all. Did Jesus care about the physical needs of this man? Absolutely he did. But I would argue that he cared about and that he cared even more about the spiritual needs that were in this man's life. What we see here is that Jesus wanted to handle the sin problem before he handled healing this man. And what we know about sin is that all of us have sinned. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the Bible tells us that because of this sin, we are deserving of death. We know that God created uh, the, the world. God created everything and it was perfect. But sinful man still wanted more. And Adam and Eve sinned in the garden for the very first time. And ever since that day, mankind, we are sinners both by nature and by choice. And what we know is that God hates that sin. God hates that sin. And that sin sin separates us from God. And there must be punishment for it. But God made a way when there was no other way. We just celebrated this Christmas season, the, the incarnation, the fact that the word became flesh Uh, The the word uh, Jesus was born as a baby, but he grew up. He never sinned, not one time. He lived a perfect life. But even though he had lived a perfect life, he was arrested. He was put on trial and he was ultimately convicted, sentenced to death. Death on a cross, a criminal's death on a cross. He He was killed on the cross. He was put in the grave. But praise be to God that the story doesn't end there, that Jesus rose victoriously, that he beat death. And because of this, we can have a relationship with him. Because of this, there's forgiveness of sins. Because of this, as we talked about just a couple of weeks ago, we can live the life of a victorious Christian. Just as Jesus cared about this, the, the, the sin, the spiritual life of this paralyzed man, he cares about your spiritual needs. He cares about the spiritual needs that you have, and he wants to have a relationship with you. Finally, this morning, we see an undeniable miracle. So let's wrap up, verses 6 through 12. Now, some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately, Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed, and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all. So they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like that. Because of the power of God, a miracle was done man's life. Because of the power of God, a miracle was done in this man's life. So I want to end today by asking you this question. Where in your life are you looking for God to work in a mighty and magnificent way? Where in your life have you been praying and praying and praying that something will happen, but if you were honest with yourself for a minute, you were beginning to think maybe there's no hope. 
Maybe for you, it's your son or, or your daughter. You did your best to disciple them, to raise them up uh, uh, with an emphasis on God's word and putting that in the center of your life. But they went to college or they went to work and they said, I don't need that church stuff. Or maybe even harder to hear, I don't need Jesus. And, and you've prayed for them and you've prayed for them and you've prayed for them. But if you're being honest with yourself, you're beginning to wonder, is there any hope for them? Or maybe for you, it's sickness. It's sickness in your family or sickness amongst your friends. Or maybe you personally are sick. And you've been praying and praying and praying, but you're feeling as though there may be no hope. Or maybe for you this year, you've lost your job and you've been searching and searching for another job and you've been praying and praying that that you would find a way to provide for your family, but you're beginning to worry deep down that there may be no hope. Or maybe for you, it's your your marriage. You've been going through a difficult season in your marriage and you've been praying and you've been praying and you've been praying, but you're wondering, is there any hope? Listen, I don't know a lot and I don't have a great pep talk to give to you this morning, but I know this to be true. God's word says that for those who are in Christ, he is working for our good. Now, that doesn't mean that things are always going to go the way that we want them to. That doesn't mean that things are going to go the way that we think they should. That doesn't mean that we're never going to suffer. We are going to. But what it means is that God is working to mold us. God is working to shape us more and more into the image of him. I heard a pastor talk about the book of James chapter one. In James one, it says that the testing of our faith develops perseverance. And this pastor talked about that word testing. And he said, it was a word that silversmiths used back in biblical times. And they would put this silver over a fire and they would heat it up. And and what would happen is it would begin to melt and all of the impurities would start coming to the top. All the impurities would start floating up to the top. And they had a tool, they would scrape these impurities off. And they would do this process over and over and over again. And the way they knew they were finished, the way they knew they were done, was when they could look down at this silver and see their own reflection in it. Through the tough times, through the heartache, through the heartbreak, God is working to mold us and to shape us more and more into his image. So this morning, I want to ask you, how is God calling you to respond How is God calling you to respond this morning? Maybe you heard about uh, the problem of sin in your life. This problem of sin in your life and about the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, the fact that Jesus died for you. And you say, today's the day I want to become a Christian. Today's the day I want to place my trust in Jesus as my Savior. Do that today. Message us here on Facebook. Uh, Email us. Give us a phone call. Uh, Whatever way uh, you you communicate, reach out to us. We would love to talk with you about that. Maybe for you, you're saying, you know, I've been taking punch after punch this year, trial after trial, and I feel like I'm on the ropes. I feel like there's no hope. Feel free to feel free to reach out to us, but but still pray. Pray, but, but what I was about to say is that you don't have to pray by yourself. Bring your family around you. Invite your pastor to pray with you. Invite your deacons to pray with you, your youth pastor, your children's minister to come alongside and pray with you during these tough times. Know that we are praying for you, that your church staff and your church leaders are praying for you. Or maybe you need to respond by worshiping. Maybe you've heard this about God sending his son Jesus to die on the cross and you just wanna uh, spend some time just in awe, marveling at who God is. Then worship in this moment. But this is about to lead us in uh, one last song. And I encourage you, respond in whatever way God is calling you to respond. Let's pray. God, we, we thank you. We thank you uh, for who you are. We thank you for uh, sending your son Uh, Jesus, to die for us on the cross. God, today we pray for the families that are hurting. We pray for uh, the people that are hurting this morning. God, we pray for the people who say, we feel as though there may not be any hope. God, we pray that you would comfort them. We pray that you would bring them peace. We pray that you would lead them through a difficult time. And we pray that you would give them the reassurance that that we love them, that their, their church family loves them and is here for them. But God, I pray that if anybody is watching and doesn't know Jesus as their Savior, that they would respond in this moment. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
God, thank you for working in the hearts of uh, your people. God, we pray that uh, our church family would uh, continue to, to love our community well as they have been, God. God, we pray that our church family would continue to shine uh, your light in our community. God, give us the boldness and give us the strength and give us the power uh, to live our lives, uh, uh, shining our light for you. And God, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you so much for tuning in this morning. And before you go, we've got a couple of quick announcements for you. Uh, so tune in. Miss Vanessa, our children's minister, uh, has a couple of announcements for us. Good morning and welcome. This is your FBC weekly update. I'm Vanessa Kaiser, your children's minister here at First Baptist Church of Carmi. Whether you're a member or visiting with us for the first time, we are so blessed that you're here this morning. Lottie Moon Christmas Offering. During the month of December, a special offering is given to support IMB missionaries all over the world. Please consider giving to our missionaries and help spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can mail your gift to the church office or drop it by anytime during the week. Please make sure you mark your offering for Lottie Moon. For more information, you can go to imb.org. As you leave, our prayer is this, that the God of peace will fill you with his love and his joy this holiday season. Have a safe and wonderful week. Well, if you, have any, if you have any questions about those announcements, feel free to get in touch with our ministry staff, Pastor Drake or Miss Vanessa or myself. We'd love to talk with you about those announcements. But as you go this morning, we wanted to uh, read this scripture over you uh, from 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 17. It says, Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Have a blessed week and a happy new year. We'll see you next time.